My name is Jill Corona. I'm 17. I was raised in Hayden, Arizona, which is a small copper mining community 70 miles north of Tucson. Atención, señores. Lo que les voy a entonar. El coro de San Pedro. El correo de San Pedro yo les voy a cantar. Entrando a San Pedro, ustedes mirarán las casas tumbadas, las casas tumbadas, pero no se caen. My great grandparents first came from Mexico to this town. And so my family's been here since then. That was many, many years ago. Hayden is a very small town with a very small population. Um, the people are mainly Mexicans with a very strong Spanish, Spanish heritage and a very strong religious backgrounds. And it, the economic situation of Hayden is mainly based on the copper company, Asarco. <laughs> Okay, my name is Betty Amparano. I have seven kids, seven girls, and one boy. Jill, Elizabeth, Jeanette, Elaine, Jennifer, and Aaron, and Ray. See, they just barely turned this into a heat of furniture. It was a mortuary like three months ago. <laughs> They held very big weddings in this church. <laughs> My sister had 12 bridesmaids. Okay, this was a bank, and then the town hall burned down up there, and so they moved all the town hall equipment down here, well, it didn't burn, and they used this for the town hall, and they rebuilt the town hall, and now this is a police station. The bank moved to Kearney. This building right here used to be the uh, police department store that I can remember of and then it used to be a furniture store and now as you can see it's just one empty building. I think that's how people like show off with their weddings because they decorate it like real nice even though it's really old in there and there's always fights breaking out and everybody gets drunk at them but that's like the place on the weekend when they have weddings and stuff but they don't hardly have weddings here anymore. Nobody ever really gets married that often anymore. Get up, you, like if you go somewhere else, like let's say to Dudleyville, you feel much better. You can you can feel the difference. But when you're here, I mean, you feel like you're dragging out through the day. You can feel, you know, you just can, you get back headaches. Like when know, I went dizziness. up north and I came back, I never really noticed the difference, but the air was so much lighter. And when I came down here, it was like thick. I wasn't used to it because I stayed up there for like a week. And when I came down, all in here was dry. I couldn't like hardly breathe. You have to adjust to it after a while. Like all my, my mother, all my aunts, all of them, every single one of them have died of cancer. Kids come to hang out here, especially all the younger kids. After they come swimming from the pool, 
and the older teens come and play basketball here. This being the only, well, the second basketball um, court here in Hayden. A lot of the parents are concerned though because it's so close to a circle. You can smell the concentrate, especially at night when the kids come to play. So it's, um, you can really smell it and you can feel it in your throat. It makes you cough and a lot of people are concerned. And it's not just here at the park. I mean, it goes out all over to all the houses and everything. So it's really kind of sad. And this being the only hangout place, especially near the pool, after they go swimming, they come back here and talk and sometimes eat. So it's really sad that it's so close near to the work. Like the Pinkertons, you know the Pinkertons, like people that control, like, the security guards. Yeah, they come around, they fucking haul ass. They'll, so all, the be, they'll be hauling ass, and all kinds of dust that come over. <laughs> when you guys are playing makes basketball, makes it all stinky and shit. Yeah. Is and that's at the Hayden Park. Yeah, and then when you breathe, you like, like your throat. You can feel it. Fucking taste it. <laughs> I think when. A teen is like in their in their teen years and they live in Hayden. They all say, well, I'm not going to stay here in Hayden. I'm not going to work at a cycle. Well, most of the guys are like, I'm not going to work there. Yeah, right. I see what my dad goes through and it's such an awful job. But once they graduate and they really get out there and they see how hard it is and then they apply at a cycle just to apply and then they get it, it's just like, it's so much money. It does pay r really good. And so they just end up working here and they say, well, I'm going to quit, you know. I'm going to move up away. But they don't because the money's so good and they buy things like cars and houses and they have to keep their payments. So they don't. They just end up staying here, really. But I don't think they really want to. It's just, it's kind of not a choice in a way because there's not other opportunities here for them. I don't know what I want to work at. Honestly? Yeah. I'm gonna be a dope dealer. <laughs> for reals, for reals? For reals, for reals. Because of the money? Yeah. This is their this is their career here. This is a Sarko. I mean, it's the town's um, only employment, really. That's what it means to a lot of people. I think it. I mean, it's right here and stuff, and the um, concentrate hurts the people. A lot of people are getting cancer and stuff, but it. it this is what the town's really about. I mean, everybody's working here. This is what holds it together, really. But it is, I think it's, a lot of people complain. I mean, a while back, it was so bad that the acid was like, when people hung their clothes outside, it would burn holes through their clothes. It would hurt their vehicles. A friend of mine's vehicle, he works at a cycle, and he parks near it, and his paint, it like gets air bubbles from the um, concentrate, and it like settles onto his, onto his car, and you could see where it's harming, and I mean, I can imagine what it's doing to a human inside their body. I mean, you could smell it near my house. The smoke comes out, all the um, the waste at night, and you can you can't even go outside. It's so awful. It's so thick. Okay, these are the Hayden tailings. Um, the next hill across from here is where I lived, and when it got windy, all the dirt would fly across into the sky, across over to our mountain to where we'd breathe in all this. Dirt, which would, I think is waste, and um, on top you can see some grass. That's where they have the cows at, so that um, the wind won't be blowing all the dust away. And it used to be a lot more thinner than what it is now. It's pretty dry and hard, but when it was thinner, it was blowing a lot more. And then just over the hill, I always see um, wastewater pouring out of those tubes up there into the other side, and you could tell it's wastewater because it's so dirty, and I guess it's um, from the work from a circle on the other side. So this is pretty much all waste, which is right across from Hayden. What would Hayden be without a circle here? I don't think there would be a Hayden. A circle keeps it together. This is what everybody lives here for, really. It's because of a circle. This is what keeps it together. So if a circle was in here, it would be a ghost town. I really do think that. Las casas tumbadas, las casas tumbadas. Pero no se caen. San Pedro lindo, San Pedro lindo, qué chulo estás. La gente te quiere, la gente te quiere, no te olvidará. Por eso vienen lejos de aquí a ver. 
Tenet is aware that the house sits in a mining town whereby toxic and possibly cancer-causing dust and fumes are scattered on the ground and in the air by the local mining corporations, but by signing this lease agrees not to hold landlord liable for any damage caused by said contaminants, but to look only to the causer of said conditions, namely the mining corporations. I wasn't aware of this and the fact that, you know, she stated it the way she did and these, these, there's no way, no way that I was going to sign these papers, you know, and I did have my kids tested. This is the first time that she wrote it down after about five or six years of living there. So when we seen it on the paper, it was like, she knew about this, you know, when we were never informed at all. Mm -hmm. About? About the um, contaminants, you know, the toxins and and that was like a shock. My little sister, my little brother, they went to the doctor and the tests came back that the lead inside their bodies was higher than normal. And so the doctor wants to contact the state and um, have the whole family tested now. He's worried about it. Mm -hmm. uh, he did say that they were gonna provide us with information, you know, um, of what, you know, effects we might get later on. Or and he had informed us that if we were living, because he didn't know that we had moved, if we were living in the same area, maybe we should think about moving, you know, because it's so close to the Asarco mine. I think um, she should have informed my mom from the beginning about the contaminants and, and the lead-based paint, and she didn't, and so, you know, that's really the basically concern. what it was, that every time that we would sit down and try to work on something, it's like she wanted a higher price for the house, you know, a higher, when I saw, you know, it's like she was trying to get away out of the situation quite fast, you know, but the way she went about it, I don't feel that it was fair. I think the only reason she wrote it on the contract this time about the contaminants is because she thought my mom was finally going to sign it and she doesn't want to be responsible for any any um, illnesses that they have, you know, because of the lead. So she wrote it down and wanted my mom to sign it because she thought she was going to sign it right there and my mom didn't and so that upset her because she knows, she knows that she could be liable for not writing it before. So. And I think they just changed the law that you have to put it on. You have to write that down. And not everybody's aware of all the, the rights and you know, coming from a small town, you really don't know about all this stuff. And yeah, you get taken advantage of that. Are they aware of the contaminants? I do. I wasn't. I didn't know about this. Not too many. And um, you're not the first time to live there. You know, just think how many other people have gone through this and didn't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then especially all the kids that hang out at the Hollies right there. Uh, all the dirt right there. I used to play there my whole life. Mm -hmm. Imagine all the people that played there. They win and they take off their shoes and they play on that. In the dirt. And playing the water down there, the pools of water, all that. Yeah. It was yeah. like quicksand, some of it was different colors and stuff. And all these little kids are playing it and stuff, and now you know that there might be lead and arsenic in it. There is. Now I know, because I worked in the construction up here at the mine, and I know about it now, but when I, as a kid, I didn't know nothing. It was just dirt to me. <laughs> Probably ate a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, a lot of kids did do that, you know that? And I was one of those kids, too. We used to go down there and get clay from down here in the bottom. We used yeah. to make little pies with yeah. them. Eat them. <laughs> get a spoon, pretend like we're eating the thing. Sometimes we're putting it in our mouth, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, see, you're like around that all the time. And then when they tell you that something might be wrong with it, then it's like a shock, like, what? You know, it doesn't okay. seem like. Okay, now if you get sick, like your kids will say, who do you turn to to get help for that? You know, yeah. who's going to help you? Because every they, they want to keep you in the dark about it so that they don't have to be responsible, you know? Yeah. They, no one's going to help you. No one's going to show you the right direction to go. And then the people that do want to do something, like get a lawyer, they're afraid because of... The people afraid of it. Well, as soon as you start to, you know, take your yeah, steps to do something about it, you know, you, doors get slammed in your face. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Quick, you know, and they start, if you start making a big stink about it, well... They start to It's going to turn around and, yes, yeah. exactly. Yes, everybody's together. And sometimes, you know, they come and they say, you know, they start talking about it because they heard about it somewhere or another, you know, the word gets around quite quick, especially in a little town like this. But... You know, it's like you got to get them at the right time and at the right place because it's like they get all worked up and they want to do something, but then after 
you know, a couple of days or whatever, then they start getting scared about it. You know, they don't want to even talk about it anymore, you know. I'd rather just forget about it and deal with the sickness and deal with, you know, the fear. How many, of how many of our relatives uh, haven't died of cancer? All of them. All of them. In their yeah. 50s. You know? uh, all my uncles, my grandfather, everybody who retired from Kennecott and Sarko. As soon as they retired. You know, they spent their whole life working for the mine. They finally get to the age where they retire and they think they're going to live comfortably. They last two or three years and they die. You know? After working so long? After their whole life. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Really? All the younger generation. All these young kids were right out of school they, and they're getting jobs up there. They don't know what, they, what they're in for. I'm, sh I'm sure that people have tried, you know, probably spent their whole lives trying to get help and then end up dying and then their fight ended there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you imagine the people that do know about the contaminants and they're working in a circle and they don't have nowhere else to work, they can't leave, and they're trying to fight for it at the same time, you know? Or they have it in their conscience, thinking that this thing is killing them. Uh, I know that, because my uncle's done that where he knew he was sick and he was going to die, but he couldn't stop working because he had to leave something for his kids. And, uh, they're just like pawns. When they're done with them, well, just now your kids are next. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I don't work up there anymore. So I work down here with the railroad. Just, I'm, I'm glad because I used to wear a respirator eight hours a day and my skin was all shredded from the chemicals that were on it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people break out real bad on their oh, yeah. face oh, from yeah. all the dirt that's sticking to them and it won't wash out, you know. It's all... There's all kinds of other hazards. And there's acids, SO2 gas, it's invisible gas. It's odorless, tasteless, and when you walk into a pocket of it, it's a pocket of no air. And you just choke. You're choking. Even with a respirator, it doesn't matter. There's no air. And uh, they train you. It's just like, if that happens to you, go backwards, you know. <laughs> That's going to help you out a lot. And I've seen guys where they just fall over, pass out, because there's no air to breathe. Um, what's his name? Bobby Ramos. He fell from a two-story uh, scaffolding. Because he's like a pocket of that SO2 gas hit him. He was struggling, you know, trying to climb down, and he, he just ran out of air. Boom. I mean, a lot of guys get hurt, huh? Guys could get killed. Mm -hmm. A lot of accidents in there. Can you give you a respirator for the gas and all that? It still doesn't help that much. Nah. There's a, a, a different chemicals inside the, the air is polluted. And, w and once you get hurt in there, bad. You get hurt in there, they wipe their hands and love you. They, now they don't need you, you're not good. They let you go. They give you a one settlement, live your life. Mm. And then you never get a job anywhere else. You know, you mess up your back or damage, lose a finger or something, and you'll never get a good job again. And they, they don't uh, they don't look forward, you know, like a, a future. You know, you're, you're hurt now. They're, they're responsible to take care of you for the rest of your life. They don't. You know, once, you, once you're out, you're out. Yeah, I'm glad I ain't there. But once you're not working there, it's hard to find somewhere else to work. It's hard to leave and find somewhere else. And most of the kids can't leave anywhere else because they're already on probation by the time, you know? But they're old enough to get a job. Yeah. They've been doing a lot of stuff to us for years. Since, since I was a kid, remember the acid rain? And yeah. I remember coming up to get on the bus, be wheezing in the morning because the air was so polluted, you know? A lot of things have changed. It's not as bad anymore. They just found different ways to trick us. Now, yeah. they, now when it rains, they put it out and the rain settles it down. So. And they don't let out any of the dust in the daytime. Yeah, as soon as the sun goes down. At nighttime, and you can see all the dust any, everywhere. And one of my friends that works for Circle said that um, he can hear him talking over the radio saying, we need to shut down the, the air things now because the road to Globe is getting, you know, all, all foggy from all the contamination. And so they talk about it over the radio while, you know, close it down or start it up again or whatever, you know, but it's always at nighttime now, never in the daytime. Mm -hmm. I think everybody has probably always had, had some kind of suspicion at one time in their life when they lived here. Oh, the town keeps getting smaller and smaller. And everybody's like struggling to, you know, make it. And they leave and they end up coming back. Mm -hmm. Because once, you know, once they leave, it's, it's like, you know, it's too hard. And uh, nobody right here, you know, you go to the mine, and you're up there as a laborer, you know, working construction. 
So you go to the city and you think that you're going to step into a job like this out there, but this is union and progress. pay rate is very, it's very high if you get hired on there. You go out in the city try to find a job like that, you ain't going to. You'll be working at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. So you can come back again. I just want a chance to be able to have what I see everyone else has, you know, like the, the perfect TV family, you know, they got their house and a nice car. And, hey, that looks good. How come I can't have it? I work hard. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you have the chance to have it, and then you know something's wrong with your health and... Oh, see? That's another thing. And then you don't want it anymore. You just want to lay down and relax no matter what you have. Who cares? You just want to have some peace and quiet. And I, I don't need to, I think I'm, the mind should be totally responsible. I think the state, you know, the state of Arizona should do more about it. You know, we all pay taxes. We're part of this Arizona. You know, the county can See, only do so yeah, much. I think, I think um, it's kind of hard, though, too, because, like, the town of Hayden, like they said, our budget is three times higher than Kearney, and Kearney is, like, much better off. Huh? I think it's how they spend their money, you know, and who is in charge. It's all the same people always in charge, and they all have nice cars, and they all have a nice house, but everybody else in Hayden doesn't. It's because I think they use the funds the way they want, not the way the people want. But where, where spending it at. I don't, this building has looked like that since I moved here. And I bet you it looked like that 20 years before I was even born. You know? <laughs> yeah. That building also. Where, where, did, where they spent the money? Look at the road. Yeah. The last time they paved this road, 10 years ago. You know, it's all shredded this whole time. I think they might reach the point to cover it all up to where people think they're safe, but I don't think that they'll reach the point to ever What, what really they'll eventually do is wait till everybody you know, slowly trickles away, dies out and then just level the whole place and it'll all be a circle. Yeah. Will, there won't be a... This, That's what they it'll like Sonora and Ray, you know, there used to be two towns over there at the pit. They don't exist anymore. You know, it's a big old hole where there used to be a town. And now that you look at it, I mean, that's probably why they're not helping. Not giving, um, like they're putting into the better buildings, you know, or something, because they're just waiting for everything to slowly decay. Why invest in something that should That not they don't want stay. there anyway. They don't want us here anyway. So just wait till slowly, like, choke you out. You know? You'll, this community hardly had any business here. Yeah? No business at all. Don't tell them here in Haiti. So like a ghost town. I think everybody has their own experience, you know, everybody that grew up here, like my mom and him and even my dad, you know, coming here, everybody has their own experience and it all has some little negativity to it. Yes, and if you have um if mental confusion. Mental confusion if you're our family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty bad, I guess. We all grew up here. Can you imagine the way everybody is? But if we get yourself tested. Perfect example, you know, that, uh, confused all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do anymore. Just go to work and behave. Yeah, and then you get more confused because you're working over there. <laughs> oh, because then I have so much money and I'm it's confusing. What I, I spend it at this bar? Like, what is this bar? <laughs> El correo de San Pedro, el correo de San Pedro, yo les voy a cantar. Entrando a San Pedro, ustedes mirarán las casas tumbadas, las casas tumbadas. Pero no se caen San Pedro lindo San Pedro lindo Que chulo estás La gente te quiere La gente te quiere No te olvidará Too dark. See, can you smell that? Stinks, huh? We're not gonna stay here for that long, Papi. It stinks. Remember that poison I told you about? I could smell it. Por eso vienen lejos de aquí. Obviously, I, I think the environmental concerns would be um, one. Uh, respiratory concerns. Um, some of the uh, heavy metal uh, exposure chronically with the adults and children living in the area. The smoke is really bad all over. Oh, I'm over tone. Noah's talking to the camera basically saying that 
cancer issues, I, I will defer and I can't make a comment because I don't feel qualified to. Uh, but we had uh, a group recently uh, come in to uh, hopefully help uh, uh, look into that period. I believe, I firmly believe that we have for a small population a high incident of uh, cancers. I am holding a, a, a planner where I document everything because I believe in documentation and uh, the times that I called a Sarko, who I spoke to and uh, how I had to go from person to person to get to Mr. Drew. And he came over today, which is the second, and he's the chemist for uh, a Sarko plan. From November and December, we have had a lot of acid fallout, but it has been extremely heavy from December the 8th on. And I've had to wash my vehicle so that it would not stay stained with the acid. And it's pitted in the front and in the back. Uh, the chemist came over today because I called a Sarco, and uh, what they told me is that, that uh, they would come and check it, check my vehicle, and to see if it was asset damage, that they would give me um, monetary uh, value, what they felt was the monetary value. And they told me that this was debris from the highway that had pitted the vehicle. And I know that it wasn't that. I know for a fact it wasn't that. And this is some of the, the acid that I wiped off. Um, he wanted to take all of this and I would not give it to him because I believe in documentation. I believe that I should have, uh, you know, something to fall back on. And he said, can I have it all? I said, no. I said, you can have half of it. And I gave him some. We had uh, been paid before in our other vehicles uh, for the acid damage that they had done from the fallout, the acid fallout. So um, it, this is not a new thing. This is an ongoing thing. All of my paperwork, I delivered it, hand delivered to Phoenix, um, which was part of the lawsuit that's ongoing. There's a historical background through the Arizona Department of Health that uh, it's been well known that there's uh, slightly elevated levels in the area, uh, levels above what's considered safe. Difficulty is um, trying to cumulatively over a period of time assess what the environmental factors from some of the agents that have been, been deposited in that area over a period of time are, are doing immediately to the house itself, to the people that are living in long-term effects from generation to generation, what that does, and also what's ongoing at the current uh, uh, smelter site, uh, what they're trying to do to make sure that they don't cause any more additional problems. And it turned out that everybody in the whole family had lead. My little sisters had the most. Um, and since then, we've done so many things to try to change things. We started the lawsuit, which is just now being filed. Um, we started the Copper Fist Coalition. Um, the TRI, Talk release, Toxic Release Inventory. Um, we work with Don't Waste Arizona, which is a nonprofit organization in Phoenix. Um, we, we went to numerous town council meetings. I've written letters to <clears throat> the president and to Tipper Gore and to different celebrities that maybe were activists to help, maybe they could get involved. Um, so I've written a lot of, a lot of letters. <laughs> Sometimes I get a response, sometimes I don't, but at least I'm trying, you know, a little. First, there was only 12 people who were in the lawsuit, and now I think there's up to almost 400. And people have come together because I think when they're together, they're less afraid than to fight this alone. So it's, that's one way that's helped. But then again, there's the people that are against it, and it, and it really separates you, pulls you apart, and doesn't pull you together. Hopefully. If, if it does go on a positive direction, and let's say, for instance, that we were to, to relocate, I think that it, I mean, that would be a, a great thing to see happen. And let's say, for instance, there were just a major cleanup, which I think we all know the real truth to that. I don't think they'll, even if they were to say there, there was somewhat of a cleanup, I think it's too late. I think nothing can be done anymore. You can only see one little window from here to our house. 
my opinion as of now in 2002, uh, especially for Hayden Winkleman uh, next to the smelter, uh, eventually relocating the individuals, the current residents, to a, a much cleaner area, hopefully uh, in an uh, area that's still considered part of the municipality. Um, the ideal spot would be about three and a half miles uh, into Winkleman, uh, the city proper. Over a period of time, they, they would not be chronically exposed to some of the things that have built up over 100 years plus in that area from all the years of mining. And they would be uh, physically away from those, those spots, so, in my opinion. Well, I'll come out. You know what, Mama's feeling a little bit sad. Why? I don't know, but I hope I feel better. I don't want my family to stay here, not any of my whole family. Even though some of them have been here for their whole lives, I wish they could get out, especially my mom, my mom and my dad. My dad hasn't found work here at all. He hasn't been able to find a job now for more than four years. He's, he's applied everywhere. He's looked everywhere for a job. Nobody will hire him, which I'm sure is probably because of the lawsuit that my mom and well, what the family is involved in. There. Yeah, it's Vasquez and Duri. My mom was arrested one day. There was a big um, dispute with another family who I'm sure doesn't really agree with the lawsuit. And even though they didn't have a reason to arrest my mom or my aunt, which they arrested as well, they did anyway, even though they weren't in the wrong. They arrested them and, and they were the only two that got arrested. And that was hard to deal with because my mom's never been arrested in her life. And that's just one incident. I think we're about to get pulled over. No, <laughs> we're not. Damn it. Well, I wish there could be more done. I don't know what else there is to do, you know, except to wait for the lawyers to tell us what's going on. Uh, I wish there was more, something more that could be done. I don't, I feel like my hands are tied. And it feels like, I think feeling so helpless has been another cause of my depression because I feel like I can't do anything, you know? It's, it's very hard to, to have to be able to and just stand there, you know? I live here with my four-year-old son who I don't want to be affected by, by the same things that have affected a lot of other people in this town. And, and I feel helpless. The problems and the situations that we have here in the environment, the family has had some good times here and there's like uh, social gatherings that are always kind of fun. Even though it seems to be dying out now, there's a lot of good memories. And um, a certain kind of, it's kind of home well, you know, at the same time it's a home and everybody's here. So yeah, it will make it harder to leave. And I don't, I'm not, I never, I don't want to just leave everybody because that's not solving the problem. I wish, I hope that everybody gets out or there's, you know, it's safe for everybody to live here. San Pedro lindo, San Pedro lindo, que chulo estás. La gente te quiere, la gente te quiere, no te olvidará. Por eso vienen, por eso vienen lejos de aquí. A ver, a ver.